Great. Thanks, Scott. Um, yeah, upcoming workshops. So um, Dr. Adams and I are getting really excited for our live in-person workshop in um, Michigan. That's the first weekend in June. Last update I got from him, um, eight of the 12 spots are full. So um, if uh, if you're listening and you wanted to jump on that, um, call now. Um, and then I've, I've got various online workshops scheduled throughout the summer and the spring. So um, you can you can find out more about those at overcominginmeshment.com. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't plugged this in a while. <laughs> um, so I'll just put this out there. <laughs> so I've been I've been doing these for this might be my sixth year. It's it's been a long time. Um, and one of one of the the things I wasn't expecting from this is I hear from a lot of you um, who who hear what I have to say. You you see how I work and you want to work with me. And unfortunately, I am limited by where I'm licensed, but I do offer personalized intensives for couples. Um, you can come out to lovely Kaysville, Utah, which is where my office is, and we can do a three to five day um, individualized uh, couples intensive for, for couples at any stage of recovery. Um, so uh, that is, um, again, that, that wasn't intended. I, I didn't, I didn't expect that, that folks would reach out and want to work with me, but that's, that's what I can offer. And I'm happy to do that. I have a couple scheduled this year already. Um, and I always get excited um, to, to uh, meet you and, and work with you. Um, it's a good time for me. Um, I know what's fun for me at my job often isn't fun for my clients, but um, it's, it's a good time. And, and uh, we, we've done a lot of good with those. So um, if you're needing some some personalized couples work and you're interested, you can reach out to me directly um, about that. Um, speaking of coming together to do work together, that's the topic of our our uh, our lecture today. So um, often often the question comes up. I'll see in in you know communities of therapists who help people in recovery. They'll they'll ask like, when is someone ready for couples work? And I'm actually not going to address that today. Um, because I, I don't like that question because I think people who are in a coupleship, uh, ready or not need to be able to work on their relationships. And I don't think there's a minimum bar to enter into couples therapy. Um, at least with me, there's not, um, sometimes where we start and what we focus on is different. I, I want to look more on a day by day basis. How can you gauge that you and your partner are in a place to work together on things? Um, couples in recovery know very well that relationships don't work how we want and when we want. Um, you know, we're painfully aware of that. Um, while we may be aware of that, I think it's really hard to incorporate that knowledge and create and look for the right windows. Um, because oftentimes by the time couples get to a point where they, they have to be in recovery, I'll say, or get to be in recovery, um, there's a lot of, uh, pain and anxiety and tension and um, hurt around the relationship and understandably so. So when we're in that position, it's not always easy to live based on what we know and what we've experienced. It's, it's much more easy and I think understandable to come from a place of our fear or our panic or our desperation. And those aren't words of judgment. Um, those are words of, of a description because being alone, adrift and insecure about the future is very, very hard. So I'm hoping today I can give some points of orientation again on a day by day basis. How can I gauge um, my partner and I are ready to come together and and work together? Um, and, and we're going to talk about how to gauge because there is no magic formula or guarantee. I hear from people all the time. Uh, I needed to talk to my partner about something and I tried and it didn't work out. Uh, how should I approach that in the future? Um, the closest I can ever get in a realistically helpful way is here's some principles to keep in mind, make sure in your approach you're aligned with this. But even when you're aligned in those principles, it's not guaranteed that your partner is receptive or ready or able. Um, so so when I talk about specific approaches, I, I largely work with my clients from a perspective of take this approach and you'll have your integrity in the end. And that's valuable here. 
um, because relationships are hard to predict and, and formulate that way. So we're not going to talk about magic formulas or guarantees, but we're going to talk about practical principles and some common pitfalls I see in how people misgauge their readiness um, to work together. So some, some ways to think about this. The main thing I want you to think about is I'm ready to come together to talk about this to whatever is not the same as you're ready. Sometimes I'm ready doesn't really mean I'm ready. <laughs> So, so what, what we're going to outline here is I, I want you to be able to challenge, I guess, some of your perceptions and assumptions about what it means for both you to be ready and your partner to be ready to come together and work some sort of stuff out. So let's start on the I'm ready side of the equation. Um, you know you, that you might be ready to approach a relationship and work some things out if you can think of some solutions or approaches that you know you will like and your partner will like. So this is the heart of uh, two-person thinking. Often, I think especially when stress and mistrust are high, again, understandably so, we can be very good or it can be very clear what we would like to see happen and, and what would work for us. Now, when I say an approach that you know your partner will like, that cannot include abandoning what you need and what you want. So it makes the task a lot harder. I was just working with a couple yesterday and I laid out this gauntlet for them or a similar one. And, and I made the comment about five minutes into this discussion they were supposed to be having. I said, only one of you is talking. And the other one spoke up and said, well, if I'm going to stick by the rules that you just set, I'm realizing I don't have a lot to contribute here. <laughs> In other words, they were saying, I'm not ready because I can think about everything I don't like about my partner and what I wish they would do different. I can't think about, I'm not, it's hard for me to come by like what I'm adding to this or even what I appreciate in my partner's attempts. So if those are the rules, I'm not ready to engage here, which was actually huge for this person. And um, so, so you'll know you're ready or you, there, there's a good chance you're ready to engage your partner when you can think in that two-person way. I'm not ready to abandon myself and I'm not looking to steamroll you. In fact, I'm coming preloaded. Here's a couple things or a couple approaches that I think you'll actually like and I feel good about it too. Um, you'll know you're ready if there is not a part of you saying, I can do this or I can stay regulated if. So contingency thinking. Um, I'm ready to do this or I'm ready to talk to you if you are uh, ready to talk to me. Or if you're not going to be a jerk or you're not going to be a butthead or whatever. Again, don't get me wrong. I think it's really important to not just run headlong into situations where we know there will be disrespect and abuse. But if your sense of readiness, if I can only keep my crap together, as long as you don't X, Y, Z, we're not actually ready to keep our crap together. And there's no shame. There's no shame in that. My skin's a bit too thin right now to jump in, or I don't, I don't feel like I could take a lot of unexpected stuff right now. So it's perfect. It's perfectly fine to lead with your partner, lead to your partner. If, if your partner comes to you and says, Hey, I want to talk, you can say, well, I'm not really up for a lot of surprises or a lot that hurts or doesn't feel good right now. Um, there's nothing wrong with leading with that. You, you can't expect though. And this, this comes to a point I'll, I'll talk about a bit later. You can't expect just because this is what I need. That that's what my partner can do. So you you have to have enough of a degree of assurance or solidity inside yourself where you can be assured virtually no matter what happens here i can get through it i'm ready um i'm on my toes and if not those those discussions might be best saved for uh, a therapy session with a qualified marriage therapist and your partner that's what those are for actually is it's it's like you know, a walker or crutches as, as a, as a relationship therapist, I'm here to support you two in things that I know you can't do, but this is how we get to do it. You, you, you do it with the brace, you do it with the structure first, and then we learn how to stand on our own two feet. Um, you'll be ready or you'll know you're ready. If you can talk realistically and intelligently about your own role in our current struggle, 
So this is not a collapsed in shame position. Yeah, 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 it's all my fault. And this is not an arrogant above it. I did nothing wrong here or I am doing nothing wrong here. That's all on you. Those are those are two sides of an extreme module that I think often needs to be completely removed from relationship conversations. Because the reality is um, everything that a relationship experiences together comes from both parties. That's not the same as who's at fault. We both play a role here. So an example I was talking about with a, a couple I worked with recently, um, really hard, long road of, of betrayal recovery. Um, and they were, they were talking about a recent conversation they had. And, um, you know, I, I put, I put this caveat on what they were going to talk about. I said, you can only throw yourself under the bus, not your partner. And, uh, the betrayed partner in the situation said, I get so angry when this topic comes up. And I said, what do you think the impact of that anger is? And she said, well, the way that I do anger is I want to nail him to a wall or I want to leave and never come back. And I said, and how do you think that contributes to how far you guys get in this discussion? And she said, I'm just realizing that gives him no room. And I said, the last thing I want you to do is abandon your anger, but you have to find a way to hold it while there's still room for your partner to actually show up. Because if you're angry to the point where I've got to nail you to the wall or I'm getting out of here, you're not you're not set up for a relationship interaction. Um, anger belongs in our relationships. It has an important place. But um, if we can realistically look at our responsibility, and it was it was a big moment for for this partner because in the past this person would collapse in the shame. Well, I guess it's all my fault. And and those of you who are betrayed, you know what that struggle is like. Did I cause this? Is this my fault? It's a big moment because because they didn't collapse into this. It's all my fault. And they didn't also absolve themselves. I have nothing to do with this. They saw, oh, that's actually really helpful. I can work on that. Um, you uh, will know you're ready if you don't have to be right. If we're not looking at this as a debate, I'm not looking to score points. I'm not looking to convince you of anything. Um, I'm ready to tell you what I'm feeling and what I'm thinking. And um, I'm prepared, I hope, I hope your response comes in this range, but I'm prepared for some variety in that. I, I'm, I'm prepared that you may not get it or agree with me or understand. And I'm ready. I don't have to be right. We don't have to agree by the end of this. Um, you'll know you're ready if you can stay on the agreed topic. I'm here to talk to you about... Um, we need to uh, we, we need to make it to marriage therapy every week. It's not working for me um, that we're we're loose on that commitment. I can stay on that topic. I'm not going to veer, even if you really want to veer into, well, who's spending all the money on, you know, chicken wings? It sounds really good right now. Um, who's spending all the money on that? I, I won't veer there with you. I'm ready to stay on topic. Let's talk about how we can make it happen. Um, that's actually really important when when there's tough, tough discussions. A lot of couples that I work with, well, every couple I work with does not realize how fast they change topics and how upsetting that is, how dysregulating that is. And it's no surprise that we don't get anything done because we, we don't stay on something and work it through to conclusion. We jump often that relates to the point before I have to win. We jump to get the upper hand. We jump to take the heat off ourselves or to increase the heat on our partner. Um, and then the last part of I know I'm ready is when I'm willing to try multiple approaches and attempts, I may understand that we may not link up on this the first time or or the first, you know, shot out of the gate. Uh, I, I'm, I'm okay if we don't totally align on that. I'm willing to try again. Um, and not like down the road, but, you know, I have... I have two to four attempts in me to get this going. Um, now, the side of, is my partner ready? Some common pitfalls I see, some some common things to watch for. Um, just because your partner comes and seeks you out doesn't mean they're ready. 
sometimes we seek our partner out because the loneliness is crushing or our fear is huge and we want another human being around. Sometimes we come seek our partner out. Like I, I think I've told this story before about one of the big first, first significant fights I remember in my, my early marriage. Not two seconds before my spouse went in the room, I was knocking on the door and saying, all right, I'm sorry, I'm ready. I really wasn't ready. I was scared. I was scared that this distance would mean, you know, this new marriage we have is wrecked. And now, you know, we can't be friends ever again. I wasn't ready to talk about stuff. I'm really glad she was wise enough to say, like, you can't be ready. <laughs> like, Go think about it some more. I know I'm not ready. Um, one thing to watch for in your partner, are you ready to go here with me, is their words reasonably match their actions when it comes to what they're telling you about how they feel. So it's not, not only is it threatening, it's not a solid position to start if your partner is saying to you, I'm not angry. Why are you saying I'm angry? Words not matching the presentation. Or why do you always make this so hard? I want to be here for you. I want you to be able to open up to me, but you're not willing to. You're impossible. Again, um, words missing the, the tone. Um, so watch for that alignment. Um, something that might be more accurate is, yeah, I'm so frustrated right now. This makes me so mad. Words matching the tone. Maybe a hard emotion to start with, but you have awareness there. I'm so sorry that was a rough start for you. I really want you to be able to talk to me. I want to be able to listen. I'm so sorry. Would you be willing to try again? Again, words matching the tone. Um, your partner may not be, or or you wouldn't be ready, or, or you're not ready to talk to your partner if your partner is holding secrets or information from you. So this is a huge thing for couples in recovery. And, and often the person who holds the power as a result of holding the secrets does not recognize that they're holding power or do, does not feel like they're in an empowered position. But if you and your partner don't share information, if you don't have the same data about what the relationship is, what it looks like, and what the challenges are facing the relationship, it's going to be very, very difficult to do things together because there's a power differential. So one, one of the ways that that power differential is addressed overall in couples therapy, we have things like disclosure, we have things like honesty, transparency on a day-by-day -day basis. This is why it's so important you read each other in. Here's how I'm feeling today. Here's what I've got going on today. Um, here's where I'm struggling. Here's where I'm working on. Because that levels the playing field in some to some degree. We all have, we're, we're all reading out of the same book here. We've all, we've all got the same information. Um, your withholding of information or secrets willfully um, hampers your partner's ability to show up completely for you. So, and, and it hampers your ability to trust them completely and how they show up when your partner shows up with all sorts of trust and affection for you and you're keeping a secret. There's a part of you that'll come up and say, well, I don't deserve any of this. And you may work subconsciously to push your partner away and they'll be confused and hurt, rightly so. You know, your, your, your partner trying and trying, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to reach you and I can't open up because I have to keep a part of myself hidden. That actually takes emotional and mental bandwidth to keep a part of us hidden. So that's less energy you can devote to your partner. So um, your partner's not ready if you have not read them in. Your partner can't be ready to work on stuff with you if, if they don't have all the information that they want and need. Um, so, so some parting thoughts here, um, again, to look at, look at the beginning here. Um, none of us are entitled to a good relationship and good relationships don't grow on trees. They come because two people work on them. Um, sometimes we get lucky and there's a lot of alignment in the beginning, but that whole, the, the, the phrase from, from love addiction is the cosmic lover. The cosmic lover does not exist. The person out there in the universe who's the perfect fit for you. Um, I think best case scenario, you get a lot of things that line up and then you have often some really hard things to work through to make sure that there is alignment. So check your sense of entitlement. I should have something that's better. Um, 
I would say everybody deserves something really, really good, but a relationship that is really, really good comes out of two people working hard and working together. Um, boundaries don't fix relationship problems. So, you know, I, I think about this when um, I had, so our, our water heater, uh, thankfully it didn't blow up, blow up, but it, it leaked all over our basement a couple months ago and we had to get it replaced. Um, the plumber coming out and saying, well, this is really clear to me. Like, I don't have this trained eye. He said, uh, the, the, the water heater is having a problem or the water heater is dead because your water softener is not working. Look at all this scale buildup. It's plugged. So not only am I going to recommend we replace the water heater, you need to replace your water softener too. And you need to keep up on the maintenance there to protect your appliances here. Um, him just saying, here's the problem. Didn't fit. There wasn't a path forward. We actually had to, well, we, we had to hire him to come in and tear things out and get it working again. Um, so in your relationship, your boundaries outline the parameters. Here's the work we need to do. Here's what I need from you. Here's what I want from you. Um, until that's easy to execute, we got to work on that. It's not just going to come because I said, um, in the same token, sobriety and recovery doesn't fix relationship problems. Sobriety and recovery fix addiction issues. It, it, it fixes a pathological relationship with a substance or a behavior, but it doesn't fix our relationship wiring. It can be a great stage to launch that from, but it, it requires its own separate work on that. That's probably one of the most common questions I see from couples long-term in recovery um, my partner says they've been in recovery for a long, long time. Why does our relationship suck? It's like, well, have you worked on the relationship? No, we worked on recovery. Well, that's you have to work on the relationship. And um, secure functioning relationships are very, very hard. Um, they they take work. They take us thinking outside of what we feel. I would also say they're incredibly rewarding. Um. And not just individually, one, one of my favorite uh, parts of being a couples therapist is when I watch two people together have it click. Oh, that's what it feels like. Oh, that's how we've got to think. Because once you, once you do the work, once you get to that point and you know what the work is, um, I think most people can do it. A lot of times getting there, getting to the vantage point, getting to the realization, especially collectively, that's really, really hard. But once we get there, once once we have the insight, once we can see, and especially together, we, we see what is happening and we have the commitment to either allow more of that or disallow it. Um, that's where the magic happens. So um, again, large picture here, I'm ready doesn't always mean you're ready. So really watch for some of those signs that we may not be in a, a, a place. And, and I would just say as a parting thought, if we're not lined up now, again, it's not, it's not magic that gets us lined up. It's really specific work. Um, and two people who are looking out for that, how well are we able to come together and what are we willing to work on? They come together much more often and um, in a lot more productive ways than people who are waiting waiting for the choppers to come in and pull them out of this relationship hell. Thank you, John. Um, type your questions into the Q&A. Um, I see there's one there. I've got a couple to get us started because uh, uh, I think these are going to be asked anyway. Um, um, I'll start at the back end. You said boundaries don't fix relationship problems. Can you explain what boundaries do help with and and you know, just real quick, maybe we don't need a yeah, but boundaries are, are, uh, essentially they're the diagnosis of the relationship problem, which is a very, very important step. So if, if I don't know, because you don't tell me, you don't set a boundary that you don't like meatloaf, um, we can't ever do anything about that. I think in, was it in DBT, they use the example of, you know, imagine, Imagine your ideal bedroom, your ideal space. Now, um, what is your least favorite color? What color would make you hate that space? Well, boom, guess what? Your ideal space is painted that color. 
the only way that starts to change is if you acknowledge my room is purple or whatever that color is. So boundaries are the acknowledgement. We have an issue here. This isn't working for me. And it doesn't, it, it clearly doesn't go without saying that this isn't working. I've had to say, hey, I need you to check in with me when you're on your way home because this whole ambiguous time between, you know, you leaving the store and getting home, that's so hard for me. I could use some accountability. That's not the fix. The operating inside that boundary does a heck of a lot to fix it. The boundary itself doesn't fix it. It's the commitment both people have to operate within the bounds um, that the boundary is defining. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Um, uh, just for the record, when I bought this house, this room that I am in right now was grape jelly purple. <laughs> <laughs> I kid you not. I walked in and was like, ah. <laughs> you know, some, uh, somebody was real proud of that at one point, Scott. They loved it. Um, the my, the realtor is a friend of mine. He's like, I tried to get the paint, and they loved it. I was like, okay, whatever, paint's cheap. <laughs> um, so, um, you you also mentioned anger has a role in relationships. Can you give us a little elaboration on that? Because I agree with you, but I think some people are like, what, really? <laughs> Anger is an appropriate response to hurt, surprise, repeated infractions. You know, I've heard it said, I don't, I don't think this is all there is to anger, but it's, it's a useful place to start your inquiry. The presence of anger indicates loss and grief that needs to happen or the need for a boundary. Um, and so, I mean, how often does that happen, even in a well-working relationship that we have grief and loss or the need for a boundary, um, even in a well-working relationship, partners who share a bed sometimes need to elbow and nudge each other, like get off of my side. You're too far over here. There's the need for a boundary. And I know when I wake up in the middle of the night with a need to set that boundary, I'm not waking up like, oh, what is this pleasant sensation? I'm waking up angry. <laughs> it's like you're in my space go away um so there it has a really appropriate part in in a relationship most of us however our our introduction our early experience with anger is it was abusive or out of control so we try to avoid it at all costs um that's like trying to avoid your partner's awareness that you use the bathroom um it, it's a human thing it happens it serves a function and the, the more, the better we can acknowledge that and be proper and, and think about the relationship as a whole with our anger, the more useful it is. Thank you. Um, and that's also how we learned about each other too. Let's say, well, if I'm pissing you off, I just learned something about you. You, you don't oh, like yeah. the color purple on the wall that I just painted mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, what can couples do when one or both of them is not ready and they're aware of it? What can they do? Because the problem's not going to resolve until they're both ready. How do we keep from killing each other? Well, so this is this is a hard thing to fix on the fly. This actually takes some forethought and some pre-planning. And by that, I mean um, relationships that function by agreement meaning you and I have decided regardless of how we feel, we must treat each other in these certain ways or we cannot treat each other in these certain ways. Um, couples who have that ahead of time, or I should say have done the work to establish that, can say things like, here, here, here's one that has come from my marriage. Hey, remember, we committed not to freeze each other out. You got to help me out here. Um, you know, other, other things that I've heard... Um, Okay, I, I can get that you can't talk now. Um, we've agreed that within 12 hours, we'd circle back. Uh, I, I trust you'll do what you need to do to get ready. I'll do what I need to do to get ready. We're both on notice. So notice how that's not one person policing the other in the moment. That's us both pointing back to, we, we made these agreements. We said this would be good for us. Let's do it. Um, so in the moment, that's hard to fix on the fly because what that turns into is if we don't have an agreement, that becomes an arm wrestling match. Are we going to do this my way or your way? Um, so a lot of couples that I work with, when they have these like calm between the storms moments, they don't want to address 
that we've got problems because they worry it'll ruin it. That's the only place you can functionally address it from is, hey, we keep having this. We keep having this issue come up around one of us storming out in a fight. Can we talk about how we're going to handle that? Can can we set an expectation? Not so that we never, ever do it, but so that we have, I mean, in 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 reality, we have some leverage with each other when that happens. Yeah, and, I, and you know, just to reiterate one of the things you just said for people is we don't do it when we're calm because we're afraid to rock the boat when it's calm. Yep. Yep. And, and, but if we don't do it when we're calm, we're going to continue to rock the boat. <laughs> just, yep. um, the other kind of question I have here is um, one partner is ready. They've been ready. The other partner is not ready. They may never get ready. They may even be in total denial that there's an issue that needs to be resolved. Where do we go from here? Yeah, so I the the readiness is a blessing and a curse. Um, I think from readiness, again, this is the strongest place I can come from. The curse that comes with readiness is there's clarity. I'm ready and I can see very clearly that, you know, that that list of words you just went through, uh, not ready, may not ever be ready, may not be interested. Right. This is one of the hardest parts of having boundaries. And I would say everything that I talk about here, these are boundaries, not that you set with a partner, but like within yourself, I need to be in these parameters, which are important boundaries too. Um, from a boundary place, we see things more clearly. And, and with that, um, I may see more clearly the grief of a relationship that cannot, will not, may not, won't produce what I need. Um, and so again, th these like watch for this, don't do this. This doesn't guarantee success in that we're happy. It does guarantee clarity. It does guarantee a real felt sense of, you know, where are we at and what can happen. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. Let's jump into the Q and A feature. Uh, my partner made me feel <coughs> unimportant for years in many ways, but mainly putting other people before me. Um, I feel unimportant all my life, and it's a big wound for me. I was an unwanted, discarded child, um, and he doesn't understand that he has magnified this issue by putting others before me. Um, it is not people, but how it made me feel. How can I make this clear? Um, he feels he cannot have others in his life because of me. So hmm. the impasse is I feel unimportant, and that causes him to feel as though like, no, he's not allowed to talk to anybody, basically. That's how I'm reading it. So I'm guessing from every question we get today, we could add to this list that I'm ready, you're ready. Um, black and white thinking is a, a sign that there's some development that needs to happen, whether in that moment, like I'm so out of my window of tolerance that I can't see this with nuance, or even, even globally. Um, I, I've, I've seen people struggle. Wait, so you're saying you have to be the most, why can't I have friends? No, I'm not saying you can't have friends. I'm saying I need to come on the top of that priority list. Uh, it's a well-documented uh, phenomenon that either because of acute stress or developmental difficulties when it comes to being relational um, or just emotions in general, some people may struggle with complex thinking and complex ideas. So the, the only way, and unfortunately it's it's dreadfully tedious, but the only way to have a chance to overcome that is you you you're not going for a moment of clarity. You're you you keep holding up the wall, you keep holding up the challenge. Here's the hurdle I need you to clear. I need you to understand you can have 800 people on the list in your life. I need to be number one. And that means if number one's taken care of, you can go anywhere else on the list you need. And number one can get taken care of. I'm not going to be a black hole for you. And you just, you have to present that again and again and again. And actually the nature of this question, that that's that's good. How else can I do this would be the way to think about it. What's another way I could approach this? What's another way I could encourage this understanding? Um, this is... Um from a betrayed partner of a sex addict who is not in recovery. Um, the question is, what does my sex addict partner's anger indicate, anger toward me indicate? 
uh, possibly the loss of his secret life. Um, I would not presume to know specifically, so I'm not going to say specific. I don't know your partner. Um, like I said, uh, anger is a part of grief. Uh, Dr. Rob, I, I love his take on this. He says that addiction is, um, oh gosh, how does he say it? Addiction is is a grief cycle that is suspended or stuck. Yeah. Um, so anger is both a part of living in addiction and it's a part of coming into reality. Uh, and and again, I'm not going to pretend to know specifically here. We we could talk for hours about this, but you know, think about the loss that or the grief that comes with loss um, and anger being a part of grief. Yeah. Um, my partner came back after a three year separation, but I feel he just came back for himself. I am more of a housekeeper with an extra roommate. Is this a relationship? He, he helps in the house and stuff, but I think in his mind, he's still single, meaning leading his own life. Does this make sense? What is a normal relationship? What does it look like? That's, that's a huge question. <laughs> this is, this is a relationship. Now, I think what you're talking about a normal relationship um, I think one of the tenets of a healthy, secure, functioning relationship is both parties have to be glad that they're there on the terms that they are there. So, you know, uh, tr truth be told, this actually made me think about all of my children. <laughs> um, I'm a housekeeper for them. Um, th there's actually a lot of days and a lot of times I'm okay with that arrangement. I like them. I love them. They're kids. They need a safe, clean place to be. They need someone to help them. And I'm happy with that role. Um, for me, if that was my role with my spouse, I, I wouldn't like that. And I know it'd be the same for her too. So um, it is a relationship, but a, a quote unquote normal, or I, I, I'm going to say a secure functioning relationship is we're both glad to be here. And we have both determined what this is going to be about. It's not one person's vision uh, fighting with the others. Yeah, I mean, I, I made a bunch of notes. And the very first thing you talked about in knowing if I'm ready is I have solutions we will both like. Mm -hmm. You know, this sounds like a solution that only one of you likes. You know, um, yeah. Um, yeah. How can how can this be approached uh, in terms of changing things? I mean, very, very simply and straightforward is um, I, I'm big on pet names because I, I think it gets to the limbic system. If you have a pet name and you can muster up the sincerity behind it, uh, sweetie, mm -hmm. our arrangement's not working for me. Um, I'm not happy. I'm not satisfied. Uh, I would like us to talk about what's going on um, so I can make sure that both you and I understand what the other one is here for and that we we can both have the opportunity to either express our um, agreement or disagreement with this is what our relationship is going to be. Yeah. Um what happens when his anger turns to rage? He doesn't recognize he's raging. I'm, I'm going to take that question literally as it written. Here's what, here's what happens. So um, the window of tolerance, the nervous system allowing this person to do the normal ups and downs. What happens with rage is there is an overactivation and over arousal from a neuron standpoint. And um, rage is, you, you could think about it like, you, you turn on your blender at a high setting and you run it for 10 minutes. Rage is a stuck on motor burning out dissociative um, experience. That's what's happening when there's rage. So that second part of that, he doesn't recognize that makes all the sense in the world um, because I do not think that rage is an embodied experience. I think it is a dissociative state. So let me ask the flip side of this. So, um, if someone is raging at me or you or whoever, um, is there anything I can do to de-escalate? Is there anything I need to do to stay safe? Uh, you know, how should I respond when somebody's in a, I, in, a, in a rage? I would flip it. I would think about safety first. 
So, you know, even, even when things are humming along really well between two people, it's totally valid to say to your partner, um, sorry, what we're doing right now or the, the way we're having this conversation, this isn't working for me. Um, I need to step back for a minute. I need to take a break. Um, and uh, so, so thinking of safety first, safety is the determination. Can I stay with this or do I need to go somewhere? De-escalation would be, how do I get to where I need to go safe uh, without making things worse? So um, if you've determined that you need to leave, you might have to be crafty in that moment about how you get gone. You might swallow a lot and say, I can see that I am just completely out of line here and I really should go. I need to think about what I've done. Because if, if that rage is that threatening to you in that moment, um, I, I don't care if you get out with your pride or integrity intact at all, you just need to get out. So you you could you could step into the plate there and lose the battle in, in order to maintain your safety. Um yeah. Um next question. When this is a good question. When do you recommend a therapeutic separation? My rule of thumb is, and the thing that I look for in in couples is um if they don't have the ability to stay in their own emotional lane. So I'm not talking about like mind your business. I'm talking about if every little upset, every little up and down, because because for, for everybody, healthy or unhealthy, this is normal. If we can't ride those rave, waves together without becoming hugely dysregulated, you might need a separation literally to restore the integrity of your own nervous system because that's almost like a fusing of the nervous systems. I'm not okay if you're not okay. Um, I, I can't keep it together if if you can't keep it together. Um, you So some time apart, think about it like this. If you had third degree burns over most of your body and you had to regrow some skin, you would need to stay separate from other people's touch. Even like being in contact with uh, clothing too much, like it, it could grow together. So you might need some time apart if you're having a hard time staying out of each other's emotions. Um, that's that's the main criteria I look for. Yeah, um, I love this next question. Um, my partner's a porn addict. Has been sober about six months. We've not yet had formal disclosure. That's really hard for me to wait on. Um, he is starting out recovery, and his behaviors have totally changed from aggressive to and withdrawn to. Uh, empathetic and sitting with my pain. However, he doesn't have much to say besides the same kind of, I understand how that makes you feel, or I'm sorry, I made you feel this way. Then he sits silent listening, but not saying much because he either doesn't know what to say or doesn't feel like he deserves to say something. Um, the silence allows me to ramble on and on until my brain goes down many trails. I've been trying to catch this when it happens, but usually I don't until after I've calmed down. Then I apologize for my behavior because I do feel bad. But then the emotional roller kids coaster hits and I do it again. It's doing so good. I don't want him to send, I don't want to send him to a bad place. Suggestions. Hey, just in light of what we talked about today, this is a person that is ready to come into a relationship space and work something out. Just listen to this. Yeah. Here's, here's the awareness of what's happening with me. Here's what I see with my partner. I, I can see in the um as, as this person describes the response from their partner, I can see the displeasure in that. I can see how that doesn't feel complete. Like th this is a good example of I'm I'm ready to work uh, with, with my partner on this. So um, here's a couple thoughts. Um, I understand how that makes you feel. And I'm sorry I made you feel this way. Those are literally just the words of empathy. And it's an important place to start prior to full disclosure and getting into impact and all of that, um, it might be hard for your partner to connect fully with much else. So, so I would say here, like there's, there's a, there's a feedback cycle that spirals up into recovery and there's a feedback cycle that spirals down. You guys need some more data and some more experience to help cycle up, like more of an opportunity for the feelings connected to Here's what I did. I'm telling you in the, this in disclosure, and then you're telling me an impact what that is like for you. 
and the, your partner's individual therapist sitting with them and helping them hold that and process because em empathy is it's both a skill set and a state of mind this is the skill set without the the entire connection to the state of mind and i hear i hope this this isn't a dismissal i hear so far so good those next steps will help a lot with this i i would suspect here um, I would also say here, this last part when you're saying, I feel bad that I just went on and on and the emotional roller coaster hits again. Um, I would venture a guess you're doing the best you can in the circumstances. And maybe until there is more joint awareness and an ability to hold it together, you have the best you have is this seesaw. So have a lot of grace with yourself. Um, it's not a bad thing to apologize for what you feel bad about, but um, maybe work on some context for yourself and why you're doing what you're doing, where that comes from. Yeah. And it's, John, is it, it sounds like it's time for disclosure. We're six months in, he's doing well. We should be having disclosure soon. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so if that process hasn't started, please talk to your CSAT, his CSAT, get it, get it rolling. Um, my husband has been emotionally abusive to me and our children. I always hear abuse is very hard to change, yet emotional abuse seems very common with addiction and often people work through it. The abusive behavior has been much worse than the betrayal. Um, I can handle relapses, but not more abuse. Is it worth continuing to work on my marriage? I cannot answer the last question. Um, I'm sorry, that's, that's too sacred space for anyone else besides you and your higher power, your spirituality to weigh in on. What I can say is there is a difference between uh, what I would call, well, the Gottmans would call it characterological abuse, which essentially, this, this is not the, the professional terminology, characterological abuse comes from crappy people. It's just who I am, it's what I do. Situational abuse comes out of situations where my reaction is abusive. So this is the couple who, until they start yelling and screaming at each other, they don't say mean, nasty things or hit or push each other. Once the fight escalates, then they do that. That is situational. Situational abuse can be held and it can be changed because that, that more comes out of a place of, I, I do this when I'm, uh, it's more about my dysregulation and my, um, my inability to, to get ahead of this runaway carriage. Characterological abuse is about someone who uses power and control to navigate relationships. And um, it's really hard to convince someone who makes sure they have all the power that it would be a good idea if they didn't. Um, in other words, it, it's really hard to convince someone who emotionally exists on a diet of, you know, they eat, breathe, sleep, drink, being one up at least from other people. It's hard to convince them to stop eating that if they've been doing it their whole life and that's how they make themselves feel protected and safe in the world. And abuse is never okay. Um, you know, throwing things, name calling, all that stuff. It's never okay. Uh, but as John said, it can be worked on. Um, let's say this is more situational uh, is this a time to wait for a calm moment and say let's figure out how not to escalate into the nastiness absolutely honey i hate when this happens to us i know you feel bad like i can see the shame on your face let's open up this dialogue so that we can do something to stop this um I'm I'm willing to work with you. Now, characterologic. I'm not pronouncing that right. That that. How do you pronounce that again? Characterological. Character. Oh, I was close. Characterological <laughs> abuse. Is that something that can be approached in a calm moment and worked on, or is that a tougher thing to actually resolve? That that one's hard because. So. I mean, I that, know you just answered this, but. Yeah, that's very difficult to approach head on because in a characterological abuse situation, the more empowered the abused individual becomes, the more of a threat they become to their partner. So in, in those situations, it's it's 
it's uh, contraindicated to approach it directly and say, hey, let's work on this because that's empowerment, that's stepping out of line. And you're, if it's character logical, you're going to get, you're going to get put back in line. Um, so, you know, that is in those types of situations, it's best to figure out how to save some money, find a safe place to go and um, get gone and get safe. Yeah, thank you. Um, oh, last one's not a question. Uh, this webinar has been a masterclass, all capital letters, in relationships. I uh, got to listen to the recording later again and take notes. Um, John, I, I totally agree. Um, and next one here, follow-up. <laughs> Quick follow-up here. Um, do you have any more resources to determine if it's character characterological versus, I'm never going to be able to pronounce that, versus situational. I know you just explained it, but I'm still having a hard time figuring out which category we fit in. Here's what I would say is the biggest indicator. If the abusive person's remorse presents them with tangible, reasonable options for working on it. You know, I feel awful about that. I need to talk to somebody. I need, I know I need to go to therapy for that. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of couples in characterological situations, like if we're in marriage therapy, which again, a, a more situational couple, they tend to end up in marriage therapy, characterological, they, they kind of don't. Um, so if we're in marriage therapy, the, the, the situational is, is we'd be willing to talk about this openly together with our therapist the character logical is uh that feeling you get i know if i bring this up with our marriage service i will have hell to pay yeah so uh, there's there's some things to look at well stated um that that's all of our questions go ahead john you got more i was just gonna say too an additional resource uh, I, I gotta google this real quick because i would feel bad if i didn't um uh let's see There are national resources to help folks who are in abusive relationships. And I want to put this out here. Um, the National Domestic Violence Hotline, thehotline.org. Um, whether it's characterological or situational, if you're in an abusive situation, reach out here for some resources. Thehotline.org. Absolutely. John, thank you so much. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you for the great, great questions. Um, another great topic, as always. Um, we'll be back in two weeks. Um, we'll see you then. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Bye.